Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this month's Caring for the Caregiver, um, brought to you by Community Hospice and Sutter Health. Today, we have a very interesting um, and wonderful speaker on a great topic. It's dementia versus normal aging. And joining us today is our clinical educator uh, here at Community Hospice, Kieran Desi. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. It is an interesting topic. As I am getting older, I'm questioning, am I developing dementia? I don't know. Is this normal? So um, I think everybody has these questions. And so I think it'll be good to clarify some of these things. So really, we're going to talk about um, that there are three types of dementia, just a quick touch over on those, nothing super in depth, but just so that we have an idea, um, we're going to be able to at least pick out three changes that are normal aging versus the three changes that are more dementia related, um, we should be able to identify how di um, dementia is diagnosed. And we'll move on a little bit to um, looking at the differences between dementia and Alzheimer's disease, and then uh, really any common risks that come along with when we, when, as we grow older, and as we have aging changes, the risks of falls due to age, due to dementia, due to Alzheimer's. And so we'll touch bases on all of those. Feel free at any point in time to interrupt and interact with me if you have questions, thoughts, or concerns. If you have experience, I, I love to have an interactive um, audience and, and it makes for such a much more interesting presentation. So having said that, let's just talk a little bit about normal aging versus dementia. So. We can explain the difference between normal aging and dementia with simple symptoms um, that we have three common types of dementia. The first is Alzheimer's, which we're very aware of. The second is vascular dementia. And the third is mixed dementia. And we'll touch a little bit more on each of these different topics, but they all present a little bit differently. Um, all have slightly different behavioral um, symptoms as well as the forgetfulness and things that happen with normal aging as well. So how is dementia different from normal aging? Well, as most of us get older, we tend to forget. And then we start to wonder, it's taking me longer to think about things. I walked into this room and I cannot remember why I walked in here. Where's my glasses? Where's my phone? And you, you know, you're walking around looking for things that you're actually hold on, holding on to, right? Um, and 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 doing normal things, we're easily distracted when we're trying to do um, what is it? When we're multitasking, right? And these changes start to take place right at those 40s, 50s, and 60s um, er, 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 timeframes. So right around those ages, we start to notice that we're not as sharp as we used to be. And is, are we developing early dementia? But this is normal. Everybody goes through this. This change happens in that 30 to 60 age range. Um, they are a nuisance. They can be frustrating, but they are not dementia related, that's just normal um, aging processes. We make haven, we can do many things that are, there are so many apps now that you can get to train your brain and train your eyesight and do things to improve our mentality. And so um, if, if you make an improvement, know that it's just age related. Dementia, on the other hand, oh, there are um, several symptoms that come along with that. and it usually occurs when the brain is damaged by some type of disease. And this includes the Alzheimer's disease or any disease of the blood vessel that um, could have possibly caused a stroke. Um, you might hear that somebody has um, a blocked carotid artery or that they have had a hematoma of some nature in their brain or they just got a blockage. Those things are what we call um, vascular dementia, okay? Um, and those particular things affect our mental abilities or what we call cognitive function. And this is the capacity to, um, it, it, 
it affects the capacity to think, make memories, and reason. And for a doctor to diagnose dementia, a person's symptoms must have become bad enough to significantly affect their day-to-day -day life and not just be an occasional or minor irritation like it would be for us. And I know what you're thinking, you're like, but I forget every time I walk into a room what it was that I went in for. This is a day-to-day -day thing, but that memory does come back. You, do, you can walk out, you can retrace your steps and you can, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you can troubleshoot and get back to where you were. And, and if not at that moment in time, at some point, you remember what it was that you were doing with dementia, that doesn't necessarily come back um, at all. So if you're starting to have problems paying household bills, using the phone, managing your medications, driving safely, or, or even going to meet up with friends, um, it's not unusual if you haven't seen your friends for a while to recognize their face and forget their name and you just have to be reminded briefly you're like oh I know you you're my friend for 25 years but ah, can't remember your name but once you've got it you've got it with dementia patients they may call you by a completely different name have a different memory of who you are um, and, and even a different a memory, a memory of the setting that they're supposed to be going to. And so that is a, is a drastic difference. And if a person has symptoms that are worsening with and um, that would normally be expected for a healthy person in their aging, um, but they're not super significant and affecting their daily life, a doctor may diagnose them with mild cognitive impairment. And this is a type of dementia, um, though most people have this um, as, a, as a developing true hardcore dementia as they're moving forward. Questions, thoughts, concerns about we've, what we've talked about so far? Everybody in agreement? <laughs> Hello, anybody? Um, no, the, the, I just wanted to maybe tell you the reason that I, um, I'm hooked into this uh, webinar mm -hmm. with you is that I am full-time caretaker for my dad right now. Um, I live with him. I moved back to Northern California about 10 years ago. My mom had Parkinson's and actually community hospice saw her through. She was at the hospice house at the very end, which was a blessing. Um, but now I am caring for my dad here in the home. Um, he is 90. And, you know, I, I can see more lately in the last couple of months, some changes in him that I had previously mm -hmm. and 90 is 90. It's not young, you know, and, but so there's, I'm just kind of trying to learn, is he slowly moving into the dementia mode or mm -hmm. is he, is this just a normal thing for being 90? Because I really see some changes. So I just, you know, that's my purpose for kind of learning because I think this is a really great topic. Yeah, I, I agree. It really is. And 90 is a ripe old age. So kudos to him for taking good enough care of himself to make it to 90. Um, thank you for being so kind as to take care of him. That's such an important factor for our parents to be able to remain in their homes and be taken care of, right? Um, yeah, that's what so I told him too. I said, you know, you, this is, uh, I have a background in medicine also as respiratory therapy. Yeah. I took all the training in that. So at least you know, this isn't a respiratory thing, but it's still a medical thing and you learn yeah. a lot and it's, yeah. it's, you know, it helps, but I just want to make sure that if at all possible, he's here till the very end, you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. It's sure. important. This is just a really basic run over an overview. So if you need more details and, uh, and a little bit more in-depth information, we have mm -hmm. that available. You can absolutely ask your nurses for those things. We have those resources. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're so welcome. Okay, so changes that may occur. Often, in, and this is on both sides, right? Normal aging and in dementia, some things that are physiological, they just happen to everybody. Um, insight that affects judgment and ability to reason. Um, recognition of sensory input. So sight, touch, um, sound, 
some noises become excruciatingly loud depending on what level of pitch we are able to hear, um, requiring sometimes to have hearing aids and other times not to have hearing aids. Um, the sensibility, um, depending on our disease processes, if we have any um, on our touch, if we have diabetes, sometimes that is a difficult thing to really have a good sensory through our touch. Um, sight uh, apparently changes sometimes week to week, even after you've gone to the, <laughs> to have your eyes checked frequently. And so your depth perception is, is um, different and, and changes. Um, learning this the hard way, I am not enjoying these things. <laughs> frequent physician um, office visits. But for patients with dementia, they may not recognize that these are actually age-related um, symptoms and not know what to do about it and not know how to communicate that. So that can become quite an issue, right? This is, and we'll talk about how this can um, be a safety issue and how they can have more falls because they yes. really lose that depth perception. They can't dis distinguish between patterns and that kind of stuff. The ability to communicate and understand and express their needs. Even as we age, we might lose a word or two here and there, but we're still able to very clearly articulate what our needs are. Patients with dementia lose those words and can't truly express what it is that they really need. They may say that um, they have to go out when all they're trying to do is find to tell you that they're cold. Or say sentences that don't quite make sense that you have to decipher and break down um, their level of thinking to try and get to what, what you think their needs might be. So that's, that's part of the dementia. Um, coordination of movement. The brain's communication is our commu communication muscle and they carry our day-to-day -day functions even though the physical ability is intact. So patients that have dementia will often not be able to sit without suddenly thudding into their chair. They've lost that ability to control their movements um, to build themselves up and they may be as strong as they ever have been before but they may not know how to control them anymore even though our brain is still sending mm -hmm. us messages to take, put one foot in front of the other or hold this with your left hand hold this this is hot uh, you know so use the handle um, we, we may not be able to follow through quite the way that the brain is trying to tell us to do those things Interpretation of their environment, causing um, illusions, misinterpretation. So that's again, that depth and light intensity, uh, colors, patterns, and temperatures are often affected with that kind of, um, that kind of memory loss. Um, retention of information, the loss of memory, and then having difficulty learning new things. As we age, we all have difficulty learning new things, but we can grasp it. With given enough time and, and our own learning abilities, we can usually grasp it. We might be slow at it, we might be fast at it, we might run with it. We all have different levels, we can do it. A person with dementia has a great deal of difficulty. They may follow their instructions once, but they may not be able to repeat it and they would have to be re-instructed, but then not follow those instructions accurately. And then the intention um, of tasks leading to immobility, right? And they don't know how to initiate anything without you prompting them first. Dad, we're gonna get up now. I'm gonna hold you here. You're gonna push up with your legs. Stand tall, I've got you, you're safe. And you may have to repeat that several times um, for them to connect the dots and say, oh, oh, okay, this is this is where we're going. The thought processes are a little bit slower. Questions, thoughts, concerns? Uh, following so far. Okay. Great. So in addition to this, uh, we I found this wonderful table that was um, put out by the Alzheimer's Association. And it really kind of um, gives us signs of normal aging and dementia. And we just as a stipulation, we wanted to make sure that there are other 
conditions that may account for some of these different changes, right? For example, a person may have depression and have problems making decisions that cause them to get confused easily and appear to be withdrawn and irritated. But also this table is just an overview, okay? So don't take it too hard, too much. Just, it's just, it's just information, okay? So we we'll start with ability and we're talking about short-term memory and learning new information. So sometimes for normal aging, we forget people's names, we forget appointments, and we have trouble remembering them later, but we usually can get back to it. Possible changes due to dementia means that we are forgetting names of close friends and family, forgetting recent events, um, just for example, that you had visitors the other day, you know, they may say, no, that didn't happen. They may say, oh, but that was a long time ago, or they may actually project it into the future and say, oh, no, but that's not happening until, because their, their days are not quite um, aligned and their, their memory doesn't work quite that well. Normal aging, also, um, occasionally we forget things that we were told. I will admit that my boss has said, remember I said that to you? And I'm like, oh, uh, let me look at my notes. I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank God for notes. Um, but when you ask a patient well, that's having changes due to dementia, you ask that they ask the same information again and again and again. Where are my keys? Where are my keys? And even though you have told them, here, dad, here, mom, or whoever your significant um, person may be, here are the keys, I'm putting them on the table. They're right in front of you, they're right here. They've already lost that train of thought and they are asking again, hey, I need my keys, where did they go? Um, and so that's more dementia related versus our um, normal aging process. Misplacing things, I don't know if you've ever done this. I've never done anything like this. Never lost my phone, never put my glasses on top of my head and then search the whole house for them <laughs> or hold a remote control while saying, who moved it? Those things I think the glasses moved. on top of your head is a classic because I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> and so those are typical things, right? We are easily distra distracted, distracted, sorry. And, and so then um, it's easy to forget what you were doing in the process of those things. With patients with dementia, putting things in unusual places, um, glasses in the refrigerator, for example, or into the freezer, taking things out of the freezer and putting them into the garage where things don't quite match, that that's not where things belong. They know they need to put them away, but they don't necessarily know where things should actually go. So that was, they're quite drastic changes. There, there's far, you know, um, there's a, a, a large cry between what a normal aging person does when they have forgetfulness versus what a dementia um, person that's developing dementia or has dementia will do with those same items. So we talk about ability, um, planning, problem solving, and decision making. And I won't read them all because this could take all day if I do things like that, that are available to you. Um, some possible changes do, uh, due to normal aging, um, just being a little slower at um, reactions and taking um, thinking things through. Um, whereas a patient with dementia is getting very confused when planning or thinking and thinking things through, it becomes an overwhelming process for them. And so you will find that they are increasingly confused and increasingly anxious and they may even become angry about things because somewhere deep inside they know that things aren't the way that they need to be but they don't know how to fix it right okay yeah and then um language having a bit of trouble finding the right word sometimes you've not experienced that with me on this at all um but patients that have dementia um they may have frequent problems finding the right word or frequently referring to the objects as the right thing right they can't quite name it they know it you can see their mind trying to find the right word and connect but they just can't quite get there and and that's quite often um a reality um, not for me though possible changes in visual and um, 
perceptual skills. So vision changes related to cataracts and other eye changes such as misty or cloudy vision in a normal aging person versus um, changes in a patient that has dementia. Problems interpreting the visual information is usually their biggest issue. Um, having difficulty judging distances on stairs and misinterpreting patterns, um, such as on a carpet. So that's why often you'll hear people say, just uh, one colored light colored rug or carpet, please don't have deep patterns because sometimes the depth perception is so off that they may think that they're stepping into a hole when they're actually not. It's just that the color difference is so drastic for them and their interpretation is to know that I have to step over something when actually they can walk right across it. Moods and behaviors um, for normal Aging, um, sometimes being wary of work, family and social ob obligations. We just want our downtime. Um, whereas our, our dementia patients um, will become more withdrawn and lose interest um, in work and socializing and hobbies. Um, that becomes more of their norm. They become more introverted than they are extroverted. And other people have exactly the opposite, but 95% of patients behave more like this. Questions, thoughts, concerns, guys? Uh, I think I might be the only guy at this point. I'm not sure how it works. <laughs> I'm the only face I see. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But this, this, uh, everybody else is still on that just being quiet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you see a couple of chats? I'm going to pop in there and just see. Okay. One of the questions, I'm sorry, Karen, is do you recommend getting a baseline evaluation for dementia or when do symptoms start? So it's anytime you feel that a you yourself or someone that you love and you're seeing these changes start to take place it's always a good idea if if there's consistency in their behavior that you get it evaluated by a physician so um if it happens once or twice in a week or three times and it's not a big deal but if you're starting to recognize that this is becoming a daily thing for this person it would be a good idea to, to just have that evaluated for certain it never hurts to get an answer. And, and sometimes the answer might be, eh, this is normal. And sometimes they'll say, we, we, need, to, we need to wait it out a little bit or that um, we might need to run some more tests. It just depends on how it runs its course. Okay. Um, another comment was becoming irritable or upset was normal with mom. She would arrive at a family gathering then leave uh, five minutes later wants to leave. Yeah, it is a hard balance um, for someone with dementia who at some point they heard there was a family gathering, they were excited for this family gathering, they really wanted to participate in this family gathering, but their mindset and what they remember what a family gathering is or was and what it means to them may not be the same as when they arrive. And so their, what their thought process was and how they pictured it may not be the reality of how things are in that moment. And because it's such a drastic difference for them, it, it's hard for them to stay. It's, it becomes very uncomfortable for them. And so they, they are much more comfortable leaving and going back to the safety and comfort of the place that is familiar to them. Thank you for those comments and, and um, questions. And I can't move. I'm sorry, totally lost. A little space here. Okay. So moving on to just a little bit about Alzheimer's. There are three different stages. We have an early, middle, and late stage. And the early stages are really the affect the physical abilities. Um, you don't notice a lot of changes. They're walking fine. They're able to function normally. They do their day-to-day -day -day work. Um, it seems Okay. 
in the middle stages, the physical abilities begin to decline. The brain starts to forget how to make the muscles work. And then it becomes one of those things where you either use it or you lose it. And, and more often than not, they are starting to lose it because unless they have a caregiver or someone that's at their side, that's prompting them constantly, hey, let's take a walk. Let's walk together and holding on to you and, and guiding you and, and prompting you along each step. If you don't have that, then you typically start to lose your ability to have that muscle strength, to use that muscle memory that reminds you how to get up, how to sit, how to move, how to hold, how to grasp, how to eat, how to feed yourself, how to cook, how to garden all those things start to go away if you're not constantly using it. And then of course the late stages affect both your physical ability significantly, um, um, your walking range is change, your range of motion is changing. And because you're not moving those muscles, the muscles are becoming atrophied and contractions um, begin to happen. And if you don't know what a contracture is, it's the muscles tighten and your body just holds your arms, your legs close to itself. Um, and then not able to have any stretching or, or mobility in those muscles anymore. Um, they need help with feeding because they're not able to move their hands and fingers and hold things appropriately. They may become more and more bed bound. And so having no ability to care for themselves whatsoever. Um, the body also, as these, these transitions occur, the body remembers how to eat but it doesn't remember what to do with the food. So an Alzheimer's patient often will eat every meal, but you'll notice that they keep losing weight. And it's because the body doesn't remember what it's supposed to do with that food. That's a very important point. My dad seems to be losing weight, but he eats three square meals a day. And I can understand what that's about. He can walk. He's somewhere between, I'd say, early and middle stage, but I've, I've never understood how you can eat three meals a day and, and not be putting out a lot of energy and still be losing weight. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting dynamic how this works. It is. Yeah, it is. It just goes to show how wonderfully and fearfully we've been made and how intricate our, our brain and mind really um, is. So moving on to falls, um, why falls happen more often in patients that have dementia of, of any nature. So whether it's the Alzheimer's, whether it's um, the vascular dementia or, or the mixed dementias, patients typically have the same type of issues. And so the statistics related to falls are that dementia patients um, have four to five times more likely to fall than an older adult that is cognitively intact. So we're able to rationalize things better and we are not gonna fall as much or as frequently as a dementia patient who's not able to rationalize as well. And of course, their um, depth perception, their visual interpretation is not the same. Patients who fall are three times more likely to fracture a bone of some nature, usually their hips, um, than a cognitively intact patient. Patients who fall are five times more likely to be hospitalized or live in long-term term care facilities due to their dementia. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. And then patients with Parkinson's, vascular, or Lewy body dementia are more prone to mobility disturbances simply because that... Um, the brain is, and the muscles don't communicate very well. So their footing is not as good. Sorry, got dry. <laughs> That'll <laughs> um, happen. <laughs> um, so their footing is not as well. They, they don't lift up their feet. They're shuffling more and they're holding on to things. They need more assistance. And so they're not able to, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> 
So sorry, guys. Moving on. <laughs> As long as you're okay, that's the most yeah. important part. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Okay, so some things to consider when a patient falls. <coughs> Excuse me. We want to consider, is there a reversible <laughs> cause? <laughs> or is it related to another medical condition? Sometimes the medications that we're taking can actually cause us to fall. And often um, just being on hospice, we provide um, lots of medications for comfort. But one of the side effects for, of those medications sometimes are really muscle relaxants. And because they relax the muscles so very well, the patient may fall. So we're always talking about fall risks and safety. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm so sorry. So we really wanna evaluate what medications are they taking? Is it a medical condition? Is it medications? And can we prevent this in the future <clears throat> by just changing those things up? Um, are the medications interacting with each other? Is it something that we need to take away or change? Is the person experiencing medication side effects or interaction? So all of those things come together and 95% of these really talk about medications, but then we move on to, um, <clears throat> has the patient had changes in their vision? Now, a patient with dementia may not be able to express that. They may not recognize that that has happened. And so often we are in, once we've evaluated if it's a medication issue, or whether it's a stability issue, and then the next step is if none of the two are, or we've tried the other two and, and now we seem to have got that and taken care of, what is another issue if they continue to fall? <coughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Has the person's mobility changed? Is it due to a disease process? Is it due to a change of shoes? Because we have to be so careful about the shoes people wear as we grow older. I don't know about you, but my heels are starting to really hurt. <clears throat> I don't walk as well in them. I'm more prone to wear flats, more comfortable flats. So um, no offense to um, the elderly, uh, older people than me, I, I should say people that have matured well. Um, but for <laughs> myself, as I age, I am finding that I have to really focus on what's comfortable on my feet so that I don't trip over my own feet. <clears throat> and so the same is true for our patients with dementia. And as they are changing, as their bodies are changing, are we being mindful of what we put on their feet? Do, are we taking care of their feet? Are we finding that the patient is really restless? And when patients are restless, they tend to fidget a lot and they want to be more mobile. But if they're having mobility issues, they are more likely to have a fall because of it. <clears throat> and if the patient's restless, they most likely are fatigued. And when they're fatigued, they don't have the same muscle strength, guidance, or cognitive ability to do the things that they would normally do to prevent themselves from falling. So we really want to be mindful of all of those things as we're trying to care for our loved ones, um, to be cognizant and, and really recognize when they are having a change in, in their condition of any nature. If they have one fall, we want to start thinking about what was this related to? Is it preventable? If it is, how can I do that in the future? How can I look out for their safety? Because their safety is also dependent on your safety. We want you to be safe as caregivers as well. We have to be able to help the people that we love. And as caregivers, we often, <clears throat> we often neglect ourselves a little bit, mm. right? Because we can take care of ourselves a little bit later. This is more important in the moment. So let me give you permission right now you have to take care of yourself first in order to care for the loved one that needs you the most, okay? Just like in the airplane, they say, put your oxygen on first, then help the person next to you. Because while you're trying to help the person next to you, you may pass out and then we'll have two losses, right? So always think about that. <clears throat> Questions, thoughts, concerns, 
about any of this information so far. Chris, thank you. The cold water seemed to help more than the lukewarm water. We do have a comment on the chat. Sure. Um, this topic is so important for caregivers. <laughs> we start to experience old age symptoms ourselves and get scared. We will not be able to care for our loved one with mm -hmm. dementia. Thank you so much, Karen, for sorting this out. Oh, you guys are so welcome. It's, I, it's such a privilege for me to have this, this candid conversation with everybody because as caregivers, we are, we, our hearts are to give and to give and to give. I just want to remind everybody that you're all important. We are all important and everybody that relies on us can only do so as long as we're taking good care of ourselves. So please take good care of yourselves. Your sleep is just as important. And as our loved ones age <clears throat> and they go through that disease processes, we too go through our changes as we are getting older. Um, so often uh, when I'm talking to my patients and families, when they they have their loved ones on hospice, I will say, you know what? This goes back to when baby sleeps, mommy sleeps. When baby eats, mommy eats. We do those same type of behaviors. We take the time where we can. We find those little spaces. The work's always gonna be there, guys. It's never gonna go away, right? We say when we retire, we'll have time to do X, Y, and Z, and we find ourselves busier than we've ever been <clears throat> in our lives before. And we're like, how do we manage all of these things before? But it's, it's just a fact of life. Work is always going to be there. There's always going to be things to do, but take care of you first so that you can take care of everything else and do what is absolutely necessary and give yourself grace for the things you can't do. They'll get done tomorrow. I promise they won't go anywhere. They'll still be waiting to be done. Okay? Um, Karen, we do have a question. What is the mm -hmm. best way for family members to remain patient when they start to notice changes in their loved one? That's a really good question. <coughs> if I stop coughing long enough to answer that. Okay. So one of the first things is if you take good care of yourself, you'll be able to be more patient, right? If you are well rested and you are well fed, take time to go outside. Take a breath and regroup. The person that's going through these symptoms cannot help what's happening to them. But we can just breathe. We don't have to be there 24 hours a day. Every second, every time, we're allowed to take a breather. So allow yourself permission as long as your loved one is in a safe place for the moment. Give yourself a five-minute break, a 10-minute break. Incorporate help. So solicit help from everybody, anybody that can be a resource for you, ask. It's so important to have people that can validate you, that can support you, that can guide you, that may have had other experiences, that you can throw things off of people to vent to. It's really important too. It doesn't make you a bad person that you're hating the situation you're in in the moment. It's, it's hard, it's heavy. It becomes overwhelming, it's stressful. So allow yourself to have someone that you trust and that you love, that you can have a conversation with, that you can go to and say, I love my dad, but I really hate my dad right now, right? It comes from a good place. You're not a bad person to feel that way. You're feeling exhausted. You're feeling frustrated. You're seeing things in the person that you love and adore and have admired and have aspired to be, who has guided you all of your life, turn into somebody you don't recognize. It's a hard place to be. So give yourself grace, give yourself time, and remember that they do not have control over the things that they do anymore. It's really out of their control. All we can do now is be their guide, be their strength, and just, you know, be as patient as we can. And when we find that we're at the end of our, our patients, then take a step away. Give yourself some space so that you can come back refreshed, remembering this is not anybody's fault. 
okay? Does Thank that you. help? Thank you for saying that. That's, you've said a couple of sentences in there that I have tears in my eyes right now. I feel like just crying, but it's exactly how I feel. I mean, I'm into my 10th year right now of taking care and it's a, it's a long haul. I'm in my early 60s and, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of support around me. I just have a younger brother, but it's, it is hard. It's, it's uh, terrifying. It's, you feel like your, your health is, your personal health is just really plummeted and uh, you struggle to feel like, am I ever going to recover from this at some point and be able to, you know, have a life after the fact where, or at least I'm healthy and, you know, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I kind do. of pulled back together again. It's you, it's it's <clears throat> un, people can't understand it if they haven't been through it. They just can't, you know. Yeah. yeah. It, it 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 drains your resilience. And so rest, eating well, getting sunlight, and remembering that you're as important as the person that you are taking care of. And whether you are a meditator or a prayer warrior or you have prayer warriors for yourself, however it is that you connect spiritually, that is such a valuable tool in your belt that is able to refresh you, to give you some strength and really ground you so that you can feel stronger, you can put your shoulders back, you can lift your head up and say, you know what, I, I'm, I can do this. Even if I'm only doing it for 10 more minutes, I'm going to do this for 10 minutes and then I'm going to give myself 20. Okay. Have value for yourself. Okay. Thank you, uh, Kieran. Uh, we do have another question. Certainly. So once the person with dementia gets to the point of saying things that don't quite make sense, how should the family member proceed with the conversation? So there's lots of different things and situations where a patient may or your loved one may say something that doesn't make sense. Um, sometimes it makes perfectly, it's a good reasoning that we're going to try and decipher what it is, right? Because you're tr they're trying to have a conversation. And when they, when you say, how was your meal? They, the, the socks were the fifth, the, the, the socks were the, um, you know, and they can't put the sentence together. You can say, it seemed like you really enjoyed it. It was one of your favorite meals. I hope you still really like it. And you can nod to them. They can at least mimic you, you mirror your behavior towards them. And, and they may just smile. There are going to be other times when you are kind and loving and taking great amazing care of them and they will tell you get away from me I don't know who you are you're trying to poison me I don't want to eat anything and you hate me and there's nothing that hurts you as deeply as the words that come from the person that you love the most that say really deep hurtful things but again it's not towards you it's whatever their perception is in the moment in their mind. Separating those two things is a really hard place to be as a caregiver and as a daughter or a son or a spouse or sister or brother because your intentions are good. And somewhere, somehow, the person that you love has gone into a place where they are remembering now and recognizing you as a whole different person. In those times, just remember to be kind and make sure the patient is safe and take a break. Step away and give yourself some space. And if that means that you have to cry, then go and cry. If that means you make a phone call to somebody, make that phone call. Whatever it is that you need to do to debrief from that moment. And sometimes those moments are really close together. It happens repeatedly over and over and over and over again. And you have to give yourself more and more and more space 
that might be a good time to get someone else to come in and support you. There are many resources out there <clears throat> in the community um, that you can reach out to, call a physician, have them refer the patient or your loved one to um, a different place. Please don't feel when you're at your wit's end, if you have to put your loved one in a facility, even if it's for a very short period of time, that you are doing something very wrong. You are not. It doesn't make you less of a loving person. It does not mean that you are giving up. It does not mean that you are unkind. It just means that <clears throat> your loved one needs a higher level of care than you can provide in this moment. Okay. Again, that's another thing to give yourself permission to do. We all have aspirations of this is how my parents raised me. This is how my brothers and sisters were raised. This is how I want their life end to be. I, I, we have a certain ideal in our hearts and our minds of what we would like to give to the person that we love so much, but that does not mean that there's not a breaking point somewhere in between and that you need additional help. And that's okay to accept that additional help. If it's just a difficult conversation, mm -hmm. they can't find the words, you can help them find the words. If it's hateful conversations, step away. Okay, I hope that helped. Anything Excellent else advice. Please? Excellent advice, I said. Oh, thank you, Dylan. Okay, all righty. So how to prevent some falls. We want to keep our pathways clear, declutter, keep surfaces level and dry. You know, if we have hardwood floors, we want to make sure that we have also good lighting and that we don't have thorough rugs because they are a tripping hazard. Um, if we have, because, you know, none of us like to have little tables with pretty things set on them. Um, if those are in the way or those might cause a tripping hazard, we need, may need to put those away for a period of time while our loved one is still able to ambulate um, and get around for a, a while. Um, as long as it's not going to be a tripping hazard for them, we can just um, leave it where it is. But if we feel like it's in the way and it could cause a trip or a fall, then we want to move them until they either become bed bound or until we have the ability to get them stable enough, okay, so that they don't fall. Oh. Wow, I went through that a whole lot faster than I thought. <laughs> Questions, <laughs> thoughts, or concerns <laughs> about anything. Thank you for sharing, you guys. This was a really meaningful um, um, presentation. Thanks. We have had quite a few. Um, I'm looking at the chat and mm -hmm. just gratitude, Karen, uh, for a great presentation. And, you know, a lot of people are, um, you know, stating about gratitude, how important it is uh, for us to express gratitude for each yeah. day, um, even if it's just that the sun is, sh is shining, yes. you know, um, yes. and also um, sometimes we just have to know that it's enough uh, for us to show our loved one that we care about them and want them to be safe. Yeah. And, and so, um, so those are great comments as well. Really good comments, guys. And, and gratitude changes so much. And it's the small things. It's all in the small things. So if we can be grateful for one thing, it's an amazing day. Okay. So, so, thank, so thank you so much. If we don't have any more um, questions or comments, um, we want to just thank everyone for joining us. Uh, it's always so great to have your participation and your interaction. It's really an honor for us to get to do this with you. And thank you so much, Kieran, uh, for the wonderful topic. It's just so important. And thank you for all your suggestions and, and um, covering uh, the great job that you did in covering this topic. So we'd like to invite everyone to join us next month for another Caring for the Caregiver. Uh, where we will talk about prolonged grieving. It's another great topic that's so timely uh, for all of us. Um, and we hope to see every one of you here uh,
be well and stay safe and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.